we, for this joint economic hearing, um, I actually have to give um, Senator Heinrich and the entire team, both the Democrat and Republican staff, this is one, I'm not, not even going to do this from some sort of script, has been in sort of discussion for quite a while. As we look at the health statistics of our nation, particularly diabetes, its cost to society, not, not only just in health care costs, but in so many of our brothers and sisters that just have misery. Um, and where this partially came from is about two, three years ago, we were actually doing a weird experiment. What's the real cause of income inequality in America? And yes, we saw education, we saw other things, but the one thing we weren't prepared to see was health. The numbers of folks in, in, in uh, I hate to use the economic term, in some of the quartiles that had real health issues and the number of it was diabetes. And so we have spent almost two years sort of digging around in the literature, trying to understand what's going on in society, particularly the growth of our population that are suffering, but also now we're seeing juvenile, our young people. Um, a, a chart came out about three weeks ago that basically said at the end of this decade, almost half of our kids will technically be obese. And then the, um, the, the cascade effect of potential diabetes with that. Maybe there's a moment here where this is not Republican or Democrat, right or left. It's actually focusing on what's going on in our society and our moral obligation to find a way to end this misery, bring back productivity. And there's a punchline for those of us who often sound like accountants on steroids. It's actually really good economics. So I'm, um, for our two witnesses, and then I will hand it over to the good senator, um, uh, Dr. Mark Herman um, serves as the chief of this section of, I always get the word wrong, it, endocrinology. endocrinology. All right, thank you for bailing me out. Diabetes and metabolic at Baylor College of Medicine Dr. Herman is both a practicing doctor and a leading medical researcher. His primary focus is on diabetes treatment and care. As an expert in metabolic diseases, Dr. Herman's research has improved our understanding of diabetes itself, as well as made advancements in diabetes treatment. Um, uh, Dr. and we, we did our best on this, Lalapu? Ippolito, not even close, is a senior fellow of economics and policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. His research focuses on public finance and health economics. He has written on healthcare finance, competition, and pharma, um, pharmaceutical markets, and the economics of value of medicine in innovation. He has earned his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Senator Hendrick. Thank you, and I want to start just by thanking Vice Chairman Schweikert for um, his passion in this area, and it is something that touches all of us. It certainly touches our two states. Uh, and when you look at just the raw numbers, the economic impacts of diabetes on our economy and our nation are really astounding. Um, more than 37 million Americans, about one in 10, have diabetes. Um, and another 96 million adults have pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. Diabetes is growing more prevalent with an est estimated one in three Americans expected to develop the disease at some point in their lifetime. And that, that is just an astounding figure that drives so much of our health care costs. Um, the rising costs of diabetes are due to the high price of medications and treatments in the doctor's office, and also lost earnings due to sickness, lower employment rates, and the cost of early retirement. These costs are borne by the patient, by our health systems, by employers, and really by entire communities, as we will hear about today. And that is where we can focus in this hearing today, I think, identifying the direct and indirect costs of diabetes on our economy 
finding bipartisan solutions that ensure that we have a healthy population who really can fully contribute to their economies. And part of tackling this is making sure that all Americans have access to quality, affordable health care, no matter their means or where they live geographically. When patients lack access to health care, minor challenges can quickly become major challenges with a, a lack of, prior, of proper diagnosis and treatment, and that's especially true in rural and tribal communities where diabetes is increasingly prevalent. Too many Americans are living with undiagnosed or untreated diabetes because they can't afford or see a doctor uh, to pay for prescribed medications or travel the long distances required to get a provider. Living with undiagnosed diabetes can delay more effective treatments that prevent more extreme complications and impact people's ability to provide for their families. Like most diseases, we know that type 2 diabetes prevention early intervention and health education are both cost effective and lead to better health outcomes. Beyond that, we must understand and address the upstream causes of the disease, including factors like socio socioeconomic status and access to quality nutrition. Food insecurity is closely associated with type 2 diabetes. When families have access to nutrition programs like SNAP and WIC, they are able to more consistently access healthy food. And we've seen associated reductions in both poverty and healthcare expenditures. Fortunately, medical science has also had recent breakthroughs on pharmaceutical treatment options for diabetes. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about how recent breakthrough treatments have had positive outcomes for patients and have helped to change their lives for the better. Unfortunately, however, many of those treatment options remain unaffordable for many patients. The Inflation Reduction Act was an important step in controlling drug costs. The law established several cost control members, uh, measures like limiting insulin co-pays for Medicare beneficiaries to $35 a month and capping annual out-of-pocket prescription drug costs at $2,000 starting in 2025. The Act also gives Medicare the ability to negotiate the price of some high-cost prescription drugs and forces drug companies to pay a penalty when the prices that they charge Medicare rise faster than inflation. These actions will all put downward pressure on drug costs while having little impact on innovation. It's clear that the most, cost, the most effective treatments for diabetes require a comprehensive and holistic approach addressing diet, lifestyle, mental health, and other societal factors alongside medical treatments. And we've had some successes on this front, such as with the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, which Congress established in 1997. This program provides funding for diabetes prevention and treatment services to over 300 Indian health programs across the United States and provides grantees with flexibility to design and implement diabetes interventions that address locally identified community priorities. Through this program, we've seen youth-based outreach, the planting of community gardens, running and fitness events, and partnership programs with pharmacies that help patients manage their prescriptions. The Special Diabetes Program for Indians has been extremely effective. Since it started, the prevalence of diabetes, uh, end-stage renal disease, and diabetes-related eye disease among American Indians and Alaska Natives have all declined. We need to increase the funding for this program to allow it to keep up with costs and better serve all tribes. And looking beyond tribal communities, we should look to this program as a model for how we can design and implement comprehensive disease treatment and management nationwide. I'm pleased to join my colleagues from both sides of the aisle to further explore these issues and more today in this bipartisan hearing. And I'm looking forward to hearing more today on the impacts of diabetes uh, on our communities from the ways we can address the upstream causes to the role of health and nutrition programs in prevention, treatment, uh, and the role of pharmaceutical interventions. Um, it's my pleasure to also introduce our two other distinguished witnesses. We have President Boo Nigren, who was elected as the 10th president of the Navajo Nation, an office he assumed in January of this year. 
He also serves as the Navajo Area Representative to the National Indian Health Board. President Nigren previously served as the Chief Commercial Officer for the Navajo Engineering and Construction Authority. We need more engineers around here, by the way, President. <laughs> uh, a quasi-independent tribal enterprise headquartered in Shiprock, New Mexico from 2010 to 2018. President Nigren was a national operation trainer and a project manager at a multi-billion dollar construction company that built schools, senior living homes, and public safety facilities from Nevada to Florida. President Nigren also served as the first president of the Change Labs Board of Directors, a nonprofit that continues to support Navajo and Hopi entrepreneurs with basic tribal-specific technical assistance Assistance President Nigren was, has a uh, BS in construction management and an MBA from Arizona State University. You've heard of that, right? No, um, the, same, the same MBA. <laughs> and a Doctor of Education in Organized Change, or sorry, Organizational Change and Leadership from the University of Southern California. Mrs. Janet Brown Friday is the President of Healthcare and Education at the American Diabetes Association. Uh, Mrs. Brown Friday has been a registered nurse for more than 40 years and most recently serves as the clinical trials managers, manager at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine's Diabetes Clinical Trials Unit. Uh, Mrs. Brown Friday has previously served on the national board of the American Diabetes Association and she remains a current member of the uh, NYC Community Leadership Board for the ADA. Mrs. Brown Friday also previously served, served as a committee member for the National Diabetes Education Program and as a special government employee and a council member for the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases Advisory Council. Mrs. Brown Friday holds an MPH in community health education and an MSN in community health nursing from Hunter College in New York uh, City, New York. Um, President Nigren, we're going to begin with you and your testimony, and then we'll go uh, left to right, or right to left? Okay, right to left, down the dais today. <laughs> so welcome, President, and uh, we look forward to hearing your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Heinrich and Vice Chairman Swiker, and esteemed members of the Joint Economic Committee. Yate, I'm Dr. Boo Nigren, President of the Navajo Nation. I serve as the, also as the Navajo Area Representative to the National Indian Health Board. I come before you to speak on, about a matter that not only affects the welfare of our nation, but also a significant issue for all indigenous people across the United States. We are here to discuss the importance of a special diabetes program for Indians. Today, the Navajo Nation provides governmental services to over 400,000 members and our on-reservation population is about 200,000, which accounts for one-third of all natives living in Indian country. Like many other American Indian tribes, Navajo people experience higher rates of preventable nutrition-related diseases, such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer than the general U.S. population. These health issues are not part of our heritage, but the consequences of painful history marked by colonization forced assimilation, displacement from our tribal homelands, and relocated to reservation lands. Historically, our communities thrived on farming, herding, and hunting and gathering. These traditional practices provided us with nutritious foods that sustained us for, for generations. However, this way of life has been systematically eroded over time as processed foods high in fat, sugar, and salt have replaced all our traditional food sources. This compounded by poverty, unemployment, and the lack of transportation has amplified the health disparities we face today. In 1997, Congress established the SDPI, a critical response to the escalating di diabetes epidemic in Indian country. This program, as mentioned earlier, is a budget of about 150 million, funds over 300 community-based intervention programs to prevent type two diabetes. Despite these efforts, diabetes remains a persistent public health problem among our people. In 2011, the Navajo Nation, in collaboration with IHS, changed their approach. We began to engage local community input to develop and implement interventions that are culturally relevant and sensitive to our unique circumstances. 
Recognizing our inherent sovereignty, we have initiated our own disease prevention activities, data collection, policy development, and evaluation initiatives. In 2014, the Navajo Nation enacted the Healthy Diné Action Act that introduced a 2% tax on unhealthy foods. This act has generated 10 million funding over vi funding vital local community wellness projects. This approach has provided much needed funding and promoted healthier eating habits within our community. However, these efforts are alone are not enough. The special diabetes program for Indians is critical in providing quality diabetes care and prevention practices resulting in lower incident and in-state renal disease and lower prevalence of type 2 diabetes among Native Americans. All these things save taxpayer dollars and medical costs. From 1996 to 2013, incident rates of in-state renal disease among Native Americans and di of diabetes declined by 54%. This reduction alone is estimated to have a value of $520 million over nine years. These programs have had a tangible impact on our communities. The Navajo Wellness Centers, funded by S. DPI have already shown promising results, uh, providing health screenings and conducting wellness activities. These centers help detect and manage diabetes and have also been successful in promoting overall health and well-being within our communities. However, the current funding levels for SDPI are barely enough to maintain existing initiatives. We need to ensure that every Navajo individual who's fighting this disease has access to the resources and care they need. Our ask today is for the reauthorization of the SDPI and for an increase in funding that will enable us to expand our programs, reach more people, ultimately turn the tide in this fight against diabetes. We support legislation passed by committees in each chamber that would renew the SDPI for two years at a funding level of $170 million per year to serve more Native Americans effectively. The Special Diabetes Program for Indians is the gold standard when it comes to diabetes treatment and broadly considered one of the most effective public health programs ever created. We urge you to consider human faces behind the statistics, our elders, our children, and our family. They all look to you and hope that their government will continue to support them in their fight against this devastating disease. You have the power to turn this hope into reality. Thank you for your time, your consideration, and your continued support. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Heinrich and Vice Chairman Swikert, and, and distinguished members of the Joint Economic Committee for inviting me to testify on behalf of the American Diabetes Association regarding the cost of living with diabetes. We appreciate you considering this important topic at this critical time. The ADA is a nation's leading voluntary health organization fighting to bend the curve on the diabetes epidemic and help people living with diabetes thrive. For more than 80 years, the ADA has been driving discovery and research to treat, manage, and prevent diabetes while working relentlessly for a cure. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to describe and offer context for some of the most significant drivers of cost increases for people living with diabetes and the work ADA is doing to make managing diabetes more affordable uh, and prevent costly adverse outcomes. According to the CDC, more than 37 million Americans live with diabetes and nearly 100 million Americans have prediabetes. Diabetes is the most expensive chronic condition in the United States. People with diabetes account for one of every $4 spent on health care and nearly one-third of Medicare drug spending. People of color and other underserved populations, those who lack access to adequate health insurance coverage, health care services, and the tools they need to manage their diabetes, bear a disproportionate share of the cost. That is because 18% of black Americans 17% of Latino Americans and nearly 15% of Native Americans have diabetes, compared to 7% of white Americans. Because diabetes diagnoses are less likely when people have access to resources, diabetes prevalence is inversely related to household income. Individuals who earn less than $30,000 per year are three times more likely to have diabetes than those who make more than $80,000. 
Lower income Americans in, rural, in both rural and urban areas are also likely to develop diabetes, experience complications from poorly managed diabetes, and die younger than higher income Americans. These costs and disparities become even more acute during the recent pandemic and consequent economic impact. Americans with diabetes and other related underlying health conditions have, were hospitalized with COVID-19 six times as often and died of COVID-19 12 times as often as those who did not have diabetes. One in 10 coronavirus patients with diabetes died within one week of hospital admission. Americans with diabetes accounted for 40% of COVID-19 fatalities nationwide, despite making up just 10% of the U.S. population at the time. Some of the major drivers of these high costs are care of people with, for, keep, for care of people with diabetes, high rates of hospitalizations. Having health insurance is the strongest single predictor of whether adults with diabetes will receive high quality health care services. More than 27 million uninsured Americans have a higher likelihood of having di undiagnosed diabetes because they are 60% less likely than insured individuals to have regular office visits with a physician and have 168% more emergency room visits. Comorbidities, people with undiagnosed diabetes are more likely to develop comorbidities from kidney failure to coronary artery disease, increasing cost and severely limiting their ability to get healthy. Cost of prescription drugs. Americans spend more treating diabetes than any other chronic condition. People with diabetes in the US spend two and a half times more on health care than those who do not have diabetes, and one in four Insulin-independent Americans report rationing their insulin supply. The lack of access to diabetes technology. 31% of individuals with diagnosed diabetes, or 10 million Americans, are treated with insulin and stand to benefit from a continuous glucose monitor and insulin pump. And yet, we know that people who lack adequate access to health care providers and rely on Medicaid for health insurance coverage are least likely to be prescribed a CGM and other diabetes management technology. Lack of access to healthier foods can lead to being overweight and, and obesity both of which are proven risk factors driving as many as 53% of new cases of type 2 diabetes each year. And we now know that rates of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes have increased and may be linked to COVID-19 infections, as has been seen in some studies. I thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Joint Economic Committee on the cost of diabetes. The ADA looks forward to continuing the work with Congress to address health inequities, reduce costs to patients, and help Americans with diabetes access the tools, medications, and services they need to stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Ms. Brown Friday. And Ms. Brown Friday, some of that was wonderfully helpful because you were actually, he and I are going, wow, did you hear what she said? Doctor? Uh, well, Chairman Heinrich, Vice Chairman Schweiker, and members of the committee, my name is Bennett Polito. I'm an economist at the American Enterprise Institute where a lot of my work focuses on the issue of high health care costs, broadly speaking. Uh, so thank you very much for having me today. And you know, when you think about diabetes, as the incidence of diabetes has grown, so to have its costs, both to individuals and, as was mentioned earlier, to the country more broadly. I think a lot of us focus on the health costs, the direct health costs, and that's for good reason. Higher healthcare utilization contributes nearly $300 billion a year in healthcare spending, uh, and that's just adjusting prior estimates for inflation over the last five years or so. Um, individuals with diabetes, of course, pay some portion of that through higher out-of-pocket spending, but they don't pay all of it, right? The rest of those costs fall on other people, including those paying premiums, particularly in the commercial market, but also on taxpayers and the federal government. And when you think about the incidence of diabetes and the cost of diabetes, it was just mentioned, actually one third, I think it was, of, of Medicare's drug spending is, is on diabetics. A very large share of this is borne through the Medicare program, which falls on taxpayers, of course, and the federal government. Um, but beyond just the direct health costs, there are indirect costs. And we see this with other conditions, but diabetes certainly. Um, the condition affects labor market outcomes by increasing absenteeism, lowering productivity of workers, ending up uh, resulting in lost work years and, and other outcomes. That adds up to another $100 billion a year in the cost of the disease. And so that's really, really significant, even above and beyond the direct health costs. 
So as a result, treatments for diabetes can convey significant value, a point that I think is particularly notable given recent advancements in drugs like GLP-1s, and please do not ask me to say their full name. So I'm going to highlight a few issues related to those treatments that I think are relevant for folks considering policy in this space. All right, the first is that it is not obvious how new therapies are going to affect the overall cost of diabetes, and that's because you have counteracting forces. On one hand, new, new treatments come with their own costs. They have prices, but on the other hand, they offset some costs. So either they replace existing therapies, they lower the use of other healthcare services, or they affect labor market outcomes. They might increase productivity. Right? How those things balance out is not obvious, and I'll say in this particular case, it's particularly not obvious because this drug market itself is very much in flux. We're seeing new treatments come to market, and as that happens, there's more competition to get on formulas, to get on insurance plans, and I included some data in my, my written testimony that shows that even over the last couple of years, some of the GLP ones that were at $6,000, $6,500 net price for the year are now around 4,000. That's a really big change over the course of a couple of years. And so thinking about how that's going to evolve across this whole market in the next two, three, four, five years is hard to do. That said, I will say it's still best to consider more than just budgetary effects for new therapies. If we're buying health, if we're effectively making people healthier, we should be willing to pay something for that, not indefinite amounts, of course, but something for that. The second thing is, is going to echo earlier comments, which is that new therapies raise questions about affordability and access. And I'll make a simple point here, which is to encourage you to consider those questions holistically rather than addressing affordability for specific drugs or conditions individually. And the reason I say that is for, for twofold. The first is that the healthcare system is very, very complicated as it is. When we have one-off approaches to different diseases or different types of, of conditions, it makes it all the more complicated to keep track of everything. The second thing is that I think it raises legitimate equity questions. Should you preference disease X over disease Y? If so, why and how much? I think those are legitimately challenging questions. And so I would encourage you to think about approaches like what we've seen with Medicare Part D. There were bipartisan efforts to try and impose an out-of-pocket limit for folks in that program. That tries to address affordability, the high end of, of financial exposure, in a broad way that affects everybody regardless of condition. And then finally, I focus a lot on drugs in my own work, um, but while new drugs can improve the toolkit available to address health conditions, there are many non-pharmaceutical interventions that can remain highly cost-effective. And so in the case of diabetes, we've heard people talk about it. Things like self-monitoring of blood sugar, lifestyle changes are sort of chief among those. And so to the extent that those interventions provide good value for money, we want to make sure not to preference pharmaceuticals to the exclusion of those other interventions. That's hard to sort of nail down in a specific policy, but as a conceptual approach, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so all told, diabetes is a very costly disease along a host of dimensions, and that's true for people with the disease, and it's true for people who do not have the disease. And so I thank you very much for, for inviting me, and I look forward to your questions. Doctor, thank you. Dr. Herman. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to discuss the impact of diabetes and some of the emerging technologies and therapeutics to address the ongoing epidemics of diabetes and obesity. Currently, I serve as the chief of the section of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at Baylor College of Medicine. My work as a physician and researcher is focused on caring for individuals with obesity, diabetes, and other endocrine diseases. My scientific laboratory is committed to deciphering the molecular mechanisms responsible for these conditions so that we can identify effective ways to treat these diseases. Over the past de decade, we've made significant strides in understanding how obesity, diabetes, and associated cardiometabolic diseases develop in people. We've also made remarkable progress in developing medications and technologies for people with these diseases. Today, I'd like to hi highlight three areas of progress for you. One, uh, the vital and revolutionary, uh, revolutionary role of GLP-1 receptor agonists and related medications in treating diabetes and obesity. Two, the rapid advances in medical devices and technologies for diabetes. And three, our growing knowledge of the complex nature of diabetes and its complications and what it means for the future of diabetes care. I'm sure you're aware of the news around GLP-1 receptor agonists. This class of medication, which mimics a natural hormone, has proven vital in improving glycemic control and promoting weight loss. GLP-1 receptor agonists were initially developed to reduce blood glucose levels. This is, of course, a major goal in the treatment of diabetes. However, these medications are remarkably effective in helping patients feel full, reduce their caloric intake, and subsequently lose weight. Moreover, clinical trials are showing that GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce the risk of cardiovascular events, 
and death in high-risk patients with type 2 diabetes. With obesity being a primary risk factor for, for diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, the potential of GLP-1 receptor agonists to induce meaningful and sustained weight loss may represent a significant advancement in preventative care. In sum, GLP-1 receptor agonists have ushered in a new era in the management of diabetes and obesity. They are the latest evidence that a growing understanding of endocrine physiology can lead to therapies for pressing public health challenges. Next, I'd like to address how new medical devices and technologies are transforming diabetes management. You're no doubt aware of continuous glucose monitors, which are replacing the painful and inconvenient method of multiple daily finger sticks. Real-time continuous glucose tracking offered by CGMs helps to prevent severe hypoglycemic episodes, a source of morbidity and fear, particularly in children with type 1 diabetes. Similarly, insulin pumps have revolutionized the delivery of insulin, providing a more flexible approach compared to daily, multiple daily injections. The pump delivers a continuous infusion of rapid-acting insulin that can be adjusted with a click of a button to mimic the insulin production of a healthy pancreas. The next steps in diabetes technology are artificial pancreas devices. These devices combine continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps with an advanced control algorithm to automate insulin delivery and reduce the burden of diabetes management. The ongoing integration of these technologies into patient care emphasizes the transformative power of digital health in managing chronic diseases like diabetes. Finally, I'd like to discuss the considerable progress we are making in decoding varieties of diabetes. Research is showing us that diabetes is not a single disease, but rather a group of disorders with common traits. By, by analyzing common genetic variation, we've realized that different subtypes of diabetes may be driven by different genetic factors and can lead to different adverse outcomes. In parallel, examination of rare genetic variation has allowed us to identify unusual forms of diabetes that point to underlying mechanisms that participate in the development of more common forms of diabetes. By understanding the different genetic contributions to diabetes, we can move towards a more promising frontier of personalized and precise approaches to treatment. Without a doubt, we stand on the cusp of a revolution in diabetes and obesity management, powered by scientific breakthroughs and technological advancements. So thank you for allowing me to share my perspective with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Your questions. Uh, I want to thank uh, Vice Chairman Schweikert for allowing me to go first this morning. I'm going to have to hop over to appropriations here in just a few minutes. Uh, but I want to start with, uh, with President Nygren. You know, Congress established the Special Diabetes Program for Indians in 1997 in response to the growing prevalence of, of the disease among American Indian and Alaska Native populations. It provides funding for diabetes prevention and treatment services to over 300 Indian health programs across the nation. And I think the strength of SDPI is that it provides grantees with a great deal of flexibility, and we've heard a little bit of, about that uh, on the Navajo Nation today, to design and implement interventions that are culturally competent and directly meet the needs of those individual communities. Uh, President Nygren, how have you been able to tailor health programs on the nation, and do you think that, that this, this kind of approach can be successful at a wider scale in non-Native communities as well? Good morning. G good morning, Senator Heinrich. Thank you so much for that question. One of the things I want to mention, too, is I, I recently went to an event out in uh, Crystal, New Mexico, mm -hmm. which is uh, south of, north of Winter Rock, Arizona, and there was a couple hundred uh, walkers so people came out to walk either half a mile, one mile, two miles, or three miles, and they were provided with bananas, good foods to eat, and education. So we had the whole Navajo Department of Health was out there. So it was a very uh, community approach. This is an opportunity for people to come out. Not only one of the things that people take a lot of pride in, too, is the T-shirts the that are being provided at those events. And a lot of those T-shirts encompass culture, encompass health. And this is something that they like to wear out in the community. And, just, and it also brings them a lot of sense of pride. This might be their first T-shirt that that's brand new for the year, and they look forward to these events. So I think that the custom approach to the community is a very critical approach because not every tribal community is the same across the country. I know there's 574 communities across the country. Navajo is one of them. 
but I know that uh, land-wise, population-wise, we're very unique. But I know that if, you, if by allowing every individual tribe to have their own unique approach, it's setting them up for success yeah. because there's things in Navajo culture that are not the same with Hopi or not the same with Laguna or different tribes across the country. So I think having that tailored approach is a good way to utilize resources. And I think that just seeing the decrease not only in, in diabetes on Navajo uh, because of, of SB, SDPI is something that's uh, related to having a tailored approach. Just again, just kind of like uh, everybody's tailored suits today. So we, we wouldn't be walking. <laughs> it's a little easier to walk around with something that's a little tailored. So again, just thank you so much to the committee, to the programs for allowing us to be successful since 1997. But obviously, the funding has also been the same since 1997. So I know there's people that need to be hired and staffed and to actually expand. And then Indian country is very rural and remote as Navajo. So again, thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, President. And that's a great point. We've had flat funding for uh, so many years in this program. And as a result of inflation over those years, we've really lost a lot of buying power. And that's something that all of us need to look at. Um, Dr. Ippolito, uh, President Nygren touched a little bit on nutrition, but I want to ask you, given that this Congress is one where, in theory at least, we're going to pass a new farm bill, and if we look back in time to when diabetes really took off, in the 1970s we kind of re, uh, we changed our agricultural policies and we focused more on commodities over horticulture, over nutrition. Um, and we saw these incredible increases from the 1970s to today in the prevalence of, of diabetes. So do you have thoughts on how we should be approaching the farm bill in light of our challenges with diabetes? Well, I guess I'll, I'll answer that by focusing on the sort of underlying point, which is that, you know, we're, we're accustomed to thinking about new pharmaceuticals, for example, as being cost effective or not. Do they deliver value for the money? But when you look at things like diabetes and other conditions, there's ample evidence to suggest that there's all sorts of other things that are cost effective if you look at them through the similar framing. Right. And so I think nutrition, um, eating habits, um, uh, sort of lifestyle changes, it seems like there's fairly strong evidence for that. And so to the extent that that's something that fits within the purview of the Farm Bill, it seems like it's something worth considering. Great. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Brown Friday, um, diabetes should be managed through a whole combination of prevention and treatment, and we've heard that here today. Um, for most patients, this involves first being able to be diagnosed, then treated with a combination of lifestyle changes uh, related to nutrition, physical exercise, alongside the advances in medical interventions that we've heard about. And many Americans simply don't have access to adequate health care that can prevent or delay the onset of diabetes and prevent some of the more extreme complications of the disease. How do issues with accessing health care, such as being uninsured or underinsured, having trouble affording medication, create disparities in diabetes outcomes for different populations in the United States? I think that being underinsured or uninsured uh, creates a problem for the populations across, across the United States, across the board, across ethnicities, across cultures. Um, I think that uh, when you're under or, or, um, or, or not insured, you do not have access to the health care providers or you have less access to the health care providers that can actually provide the information that you need so that you can take better care of yourself. Uh, you go and see a physician or a nurse practitioner or a diabetes educator for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then the rest of the time you have to do it yourself. So it's, it, that, those visits are extremely um, important and valuable because during the, if you have access to health care because you're well insured, you have those visits in order to get those, those diamonds, those, those jewels that, you, that will be able to take you when you leave there to take better care of yourself, to know how to take your medications, not just to take them, but how to take them, and also to uh, choose, have better choices. Um, underinsured does not necessarily, does kind of correlate also with uh, food insecurity. Uh, frequently people who are under and, and, uh, 
are uninsured are in areas or food deserts where uh, healthier foods are just not available, where their supermarkets are just not available or not close to them, even in, um, in both urban and rural areas. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your testimony today. Um, this is a, a, an, a topic of incredible interest to both the Vice Chairman and myself. I'm going to have to go over to a probes and I'm going to leave it in his capable hands. But I really want to thank all of you for your, your input. And this, is, this has huge budget ramifications, but it also has huge ramifications for every individual constituent of ours. Thank you, Senator Heinrich. Um, I'm going to try to be respectful for everyone's schedule because you're here during sort of the screwy time of year. Um, Senator Lee, um, you're up. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. It's great to have all of you here, and it's good to see my friend President Nygren again. He and I hold the alliance between Utah and Arizona in check. I was born in Arizona and moved to Utah as an infant. He was born in Utah, moved to Arizona young in life. And so uh, uh, it's good to see you, sir. Um, I'm grateful, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman, for the fact that you've scheduled this hearing. This is a, a really important topic. Uh, as of 2018, there were about 185,000 uh, people living with diabetes in the state of Utah alone. And this is a significant disease. Uh, it, it's a significant disease that presents uh, all kinds of challenges. It manifests itself 24 hours a day. It never sleeps. And in the case of type 1 diabetics, there is no reasonable prospect of living without it. There's no reasonable prospect uh, with technology in existence today of becoming no longer insulin dependent. It's essentially with you for the rest of your life. And so as a result of that, this causes all kinds of headaches financially, emotionally, in every aspect of your life, at every moment of your day, it can step in and cause problems. Well, the subject of today's hearing focuses on one disease. I, I believe my comments, in some instances, may be relevant to multiple conditions. I believe the federal government has itself been one of the main driving obstacles to increased innovation and uh, we know, of course, that increased innovation uh, brings about higher quality, uh, better prospects for treatment of the disease, and ultimately brings down uh, the cost. It produces cost savings with additional competition. Sometimes when confronted with issues such as drug shortages and high costs, the government um, uh, seeks impulsively to intervene through increased spending and even more regulation. But this strategy ignores the fact that such shortages and those high prices are often the result of excessive and unwise government action in the first place. It shows up all the time in, in the case of overregulation. It's so difficult to get approval, sometimes needlessly so, that uh, there are fewer and fewer competitors. And it's a natural barrier to entry. Um, sometimes it comes about in the form of price controls. Take the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, uh, which seeks to impose price controls on certain pharmaceuticals. Now, the Congressional Budget Office, the uh, nonpartisan entity that we hire uh, to perform analyses like, like this, predicted that this would result in 15 fewer new drugs being launched over the next 30 years. And ex experts are increasingly warning that this policy will exacerbate shortages. Instead of increasing spending and imposing mandates and uh, uh, engaging in an even uh, uh, more aggressive regulatory action, in many instances, Congress just needs to buckle down and focus on addressing uh, the excessive government intervention problem, uh, dealing with the regulatory uh, stranglehold uh, that, that exists. And I'd like to talk about two pieces of legislation that I've introduced to address those regulations that prevent uh, some of these innovative new treatments from coming forward and lower cost drugs from coming to market. Recently, I introduced S2305, the Biosimilar Red Tape Elimination Act. Uh, this is a bipartisan bill uh, that I filed alongside my colleague Senators Lujan, Braun, and Vance. The bill would align the U.S.'s biosimilar program um, along with the rest of the developed world by getting rid of the arbitrary, unwise, and unnecessary distinction between approved biosimilars 
and interchangeable biosimilars. Biosimilars, you see, that's a, that's a word we use uh, that, that's um, essentially the functional equivalent of generics uh, for complex biological drugs. The U.S. is the only country that has these two tiers of approval, approval and interchangeability. Congress created the interchangeability designation. I have concern that there might be a risk of switching from one biologic to its biosimilar, and that they might not function the same way, and that might cause problems. However, those concerns simply have not been borne out empirically. The science doesn't back them up. What we gain from the distinction is uh, next to nothing, and what we lose is significant. And a lot of voices in the scientific community have argued that the FDA's initial approval of a biosimilar is sufficient to establish that the biosimilar is, in fact, interchangeable uh, to, its, uh, to and with its, its reference product. Moreover, the interchangeability designation has confused states, patients, doctors, uh, and those who work with them by, by signaling that biosimilars are significantly different from their reference products. This, in turn, makes it less likely that they'll be available uh, for use, that they will be used as substitutes, and uh, the availability and use of substitutes brings down costs. And so interchangeability thus raises costs, because biosimilars would otherwise provide much-needed competition for biologics. Biologic drugs make up approximately 46 percent of U.S. prescription drug spending, despite making up less than one-half of 1 percent of all prescriptions, just 0.4 percent. So when we talk about the high cost of drugs, we're often really talking about biologics, even though they're a tiny, tiny share of the overall picture. My bill would help increase biosimilar competition by declaring that all biosimilars, upon initial approval, shall be deemed interchangeable. Now, the FDA's subject matter experts have communicated to my office that the bill would align uh, our biosimilar program with current scientific understanding and improve biosimilar approval and uptake. This bipartisan legislation would help usher in greater biosimilar competition, thus reducing prices and benefiting all patients, including and especially those with type 1 diabetes, who are, for the rest of their lives, dependent on insulin. Another way that I've sought to support type 1 diabetes is by exploring ways in which the current regulations simply don't make sense for innovative treatments, treatments of the sort that could actually bring about a functional cure or, uh, uh, for the disease or something approaching that. Uh, when we just throw money at government programs, sometimes we incentivize the status quo. We lock in on existing technology. To use an analogy, if we had done that in um, uh, our, our music listening devices, we might still be stuck in the eight-track tape world, something most people in this room probably don't even remember. We don't want to do that with healthcare, especially in an area like the treatment of type 1 diabetes, where technological advances are so important. For example, this year I was joined by Senators Budd and Blackburn in introducing S-2205, the Increased Support for Life-Saving Endocrine Treatment Act, or the Islet Act. Islets are these, these microorgans inside the pancreas that produce insulin. Now, patients who have type 1 diabetes don't have more normally functioning pancreatic islet cells. We're not sure why, but they stop working. The theory is that there's a, an autoimmune condition that attacks the, the healthy pancreatic islet cells and kills them or causes them to be non-functional. So they routinely require these insulin injections. These treatment options are important, but they can become burdensome and expensive and cause the patient constantly to have to chase between highs and lows, which is its own form of hell. Thankfully, we do have other options and possibilities. Scientists have found ways to take pancreatic islet cells from deceased donors and transplant them into the bodies of patients with type 1 diabetes. Some patients who have received these procedures have been able to go years without either any insulin injections or any type of continuous glucose monitoring. But regulations have squashed the procedure. They've made it almost impossible. Rather than regulating islets as organs, 
HHS and FDA have regulated islets as drugs since 1993, despite the fact that other countries appropriately regulate islets as, as organs and not as drugs. We have to take care of this. We have to fix this problem. And uh, I, I have serious concerns about the FDA's recent action on this. Uh, the FDA recently approved a drug for this treatment uh, rather than going the route proposed by the Islet Act. And uh, 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 I'm out of time. I wish I could had more time to do this, but I, I do want to know eventually from the FDA, how did it decide to approve this product's biological licensing application as a drug? Especially since one of their previous reports had said that the agency couldn't assure the product's attributes correlate with clinical outcomes. And how will the FDA's decision impact access to allergenic islet transplantation? Would such procedures be more affordable and accessible if islets were regulated as organs? The answer is almost certainly yes. The FDA has a lot to answer for. In this and in countless other areas, they're needlessly making this disease more expensive, more deadly, more long-lasting, simply because of their own regulatory malfeasance. Thank you. First of all, Mr. Vice Chairman Swanker, thank you for convening this. I really greatly appreciate it. Thank all of you for being here. I thought I knew a lot about diabetes, and I've learned so much this morning. I want to add one factoid that came from our last Joint Economic Committee meeting when uh, Mick Mulvaney, who used to chair the, the um, Office of Budget Management, you know, OMB, we talking about how much of the Medicare budget spent on end-stage renal disease on dialysis, and the number he came up with was 31%. There's roughly $250 billion a year of taxpayer money just spent on dialysis. You know, uh, Senator Lee just talked about not incentivizing the status quo. A perfect comment because we're marking up the, the agriculture, the five-year farm bill right now. And uh, this is a very real big, because the farm bill entrenches food policy in a way that supports our current food behaviors. By subsidizing commodity crops, our current food, uh, and rather than working on ensuring that specialty crops can be produced, um, we're sort of denying the nutritious greens that we need to do. And we're really good at making corn cheap and sugar cheap, and, and that then, of course, it gives us a food industry that specializes in making highly processed foods without the education and intervention that will keep us from just continuing to promote type 2 diabetes. So we need to be concerned about unintentionally structuring a farm system at the federal level that supports the trend of obesity. But if you look at the rest of the Farm Bill, you have um, SNAP and WIC. We know that the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program reduces severe food insecurity between 12 and 19 percent. And it is food insecurity and inadequate nutrition, as Mrs. Brown Friday pointed out. You know, the, the lower the income, the more likely you are to get diabetes. And the higher the income, the better the food, the less likely. Um, we've, we're struggling with the budget right now where they're talking about fiscal year funding for 2024 for the SNAP program at a level of 2007. I mean, rolling it back decades. Same with, with the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children's program. They're going to cut it by $800 million, which is 5 million women and children losing fruit and vegetable vouchers. So we've really got to look hard at the Farm Bill in, in, in the light of the diabetes challenge that we're facing right now. Uh, Ms. Brown Friday talked about food deserts. President Nygren, can you specifically talk about food deserts in the Navajo Nation? Uh, Congressman, thank you. Uh, when it comes to food deserts, could you... Um, uh, how big a challenge is it for you with the, the, the Navajos who live both on the reservation and off in terms of the ability to get the healthy food okay. that will give them the lifestyle they need? Okay. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, when it comes to food, and having grown up myself, the nearest grocery was 75 miles, which is Farmington, New Mexico. So in order to get to a Walmart, you had to go 75 miles where I grew up from. And most of the time, the nearest um, grocery store is the local trading post or the local gas station. So all of us have been in a gas station. If you go to a Speedway or a Sinclair or whatever the gas station is, most of the time it's uh, candy, food, chips, uh, things that are normally for people that are just on the road and headed to a certain direction. So I know that one of the things that that's why we impose that tax on junk food to try to hopefully encourage our grocery stores and our gas stations to at least 
carries some fresh fruits, some fresh vegetables and things like that. But it's just when you're in really remote locations like Navajo, it's difficult to get access to quality uh, foods. Uh, that's kind of the the landscape of the Navajo Nation is you can go one hour, two hours, and the only thing you'll find is gas stations. So I think the, the location of more um, f uh, stores that offer uh, farm goods would be great because I know on Navajo we're really trying to encourage a lot more of our people to be farmers, to utilize some of the water, to go back to traditional practices because overall I think that when it comes to being able to be able to uh, farm and sell foods and groceries. Uh, I, th I think that's a, a way what the, as president, I'm trying to encourage our people to do that. But regular grocery stores, they're hard to find. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown Friday, as you know, so much of the debate on the Hill the last 20 years has been about health insurance and access to health insurance for the American people. Can you talk from your perspective at ADA and, and others about why health insurance is critical for people with diabetes, especially we talked about CGMs, the continuous glucose monitors, how do you get a CGM if you don't have health insurance? I would say it's basically impossible. Thank you so much for reminding me. I would say it's basically impossible to get a CGM without health insurance because most people who are under or, or uninsured do not, cannot afford the cost of a CGM and uh, all the supplies that go with it. And so, therefore, the American Diabetes Association is really supporting uh, people uh, having better access to health insurance, uh, easier access to health insurance so that they can have, they can afford the medications and the, um, the instruments and the technology that could actually help them uh, have a better life with relation to their diabetes. Great. Th thank you very much. And Dr. Herman, I'm very excited about the, the, uh, the agonists um, and, and the impact that they're having. Um, but, I, but I agree with you that we can't just think about taking a pill um, to solve all this problem. Are you at all concerned about the downsides? The, there have been latest reports about stomach paralysis or gra gastroparesis. How are we, how are we balancing the, the negative side effects on these agonists? So that, that's, that's a really uh, important question, and, and it's quite clear that the, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, many patients that take them, um, uh, experience some sort of gastrointestinal side effect, including gastroparesis, so slowing of the, uh, the transit of food um, through the GI tract and, and some combination of constipation, diarrhea, or, or, or uh, abdominal distension. Um, and and we've, we've put together kind of algorithms for titrating these medications to try to, to, to avoid some of those uh, side effects. Um, the, most people, if they continue those medications, they tolerate them, um, even with some of the side effects, the side effects tend to go away with time. So uh, those gastrointestinal side effects do not seem to be permanent or persistent. Some people can't tolerate the medications because of these side effects, and they choose not to continue them, and then we, 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 we move to other options. But the majority of patients can tolerate those medications, and those side effects tend to wane. Now, the, the, the other aspect of your question is, what are the long-term potential adverse effects? And... Um, and, and to date, we, we have not identified any significant uh, long-term adverse events or effects related to GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, they, they are clearly in large clinical studies reducing, you know, uh, reducing the use of insulin, lowering glycemia, reducing the use of insulin, but reducing cardiovascular events, reducing all-cause mortality. Um, so they, they, are, they are saving lives. Um, and we have not identified any long-term adverse consequences at this point. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Ms. Malatakis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate you all participating in this important hearing. Um, obviously, we want to be proactive to help Americans stay healthy, to improve their quality of life, to lower their medical costs, and to also uh, save taxpayers money. And it's no secret that Medicare has a solvency problem and diabetes and obesity are some of the main drivers. Nearly one-third of Medicare... Uh, spend is attributable to diabetes population, and as the obesity rate in the U.S. continues to rise, so will the rate of diabetes. At nearly $300 billion, diabetes currently accounts for one-fourth of all U.S. health care spending. The Congressional Budget Office has identified several options to rein in costs. However, many of these could be harmful to our seniors already suffering from inflation, uh, promising new drugs and medical devices such as GLP-1, Ozempic, 
and, and continuous glucose monitoring certainly should play a role in reducing the risks di diabetics face and lowering costs to both individual finances and the federal government. However, however, other innovations are happening in the healthcare space to treat diabetes, obesity, and other diet-related diseases. So again, people can live longer, healthier, and happy lives. One of these innovations is medical nutrition therapy. M MNT is provided by a nutritionist with the goal of assisting a patient choose and buy foods that are healthier, manage complex medical issues like diabetes by creating sustainable, behavioral changes. In a nationwide uh, representative study, a large healthcare provider pr uh, showed that $130 per member per month savings, or nearly $1,600 per year, from giving members over 65 access to this type of nutrition guidance. But today, in Medicare, only diabetes and renal disease are covered, while obesity, prediabetes, and other chronic illnesses which lead to diabetes related to poor nutrition is not. Yet, if we look at the private uh, a payer space and in Medicaid, we are seeing MNT coupled with tools to stretch people's food dollars in ways that allow them to meet their diet, cultural, and religious needs, saving costs to patients, saving costs to the system, and improving health, health outcomes. Uh, my staff re recently met with a company that works with private payers, uh, Medicare Advantage plans, and Medicaid MCOs to deliver telenutrition services to patients, and they have data right now that shows MNT. Patients lose an average between 4 to 6.5% of their weight and continue losing weight after year two due to behavioral changes. Uh, Mr. Ippolito, should Congress press entities like the Congressional Budget Office to review this data to help us understand how we can leverage nutritional programs as a strategy to provide relief to those at risk of diabetes, as well as to taxpayers continually paying for it? Uh, well, I guess my short answer is that I think Medicare could use any budget help they can get. So if, if you've got a, a proposal that could save money, then it certainly seems like something CBO should look at. Anyone else want to chime in before I move to my next point? All right. Well, during my time in Congress, I've been advocating and pushing uh, to require, at least in part, or incentivize SNAP recipients to purchase healthy foods. And I'm uh, joining Congressman Garbarino, also of New York, on an effort to end a ban on purchasing prepared and hot foods with SNAP, uh, which, which would be, I think, a big step. Uh, Dr. Herman, how, how would these reforms in the SNAP program affect the rates of obesity and diabetes among recipients? And do you believe that this would play a role in reducing government uh, spending on obesity-related chronic conditions? So, so it's an excellent question. I, I have to say I am not uh, an economist in a, uh, or an epidemiologist, so the impact of changing policy on, on spending is really outside of my expertise. What I would say is that, that lifestyle management is always a part of diabetes and obesity care um, and, and has demonstrated benefits. So. Yeah, and I guess that really is, at the end of the day, the, the real question is, will it help people improve uh, their health? Uh, will it lead to healthier options for Americans uh, who are, are SNAP recipients so they can uh, make, make these, uh, these choices? I mean, to not allow for prepared or hot food, I think, is a, is a mistake that probably pushes people into a different direction uh, or, or some of these um, you know, preserved foods and stuff like that. Anybody else would like to respond? Yes, um, Ms. Malitakis, I would say that um, anytime anyone has an opportunity to have a healthier diet, I think that they would be able to take advantage of it. And I think uh, it, with the programs that you are proposing that um, even started at younger ages, the younger you start in these programs, the younger you are exposed to healthier foods, the more likely you are to continue that into um, adulthood. And prevention, I think, is really the key. And I think that prevention of obesity is uh, definitely something that can be uh, beneficial from these programs. Right. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, Ms. Moore. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the panel uh, for being here today. Um, I <clears throat> was caught up in other duty, so I was late, but I was listening to a lot of your testimony uh, before I arrived. And I was uh, intrigued, uh, Dr. Brown, Friday, by some of your testimony that talked about diabetes, uh, the onset of diabetes starting at younger ages, and not, di not juvenile diabetes, but type 2 diabetes. Um, uh, 
And do you attribute that to the junk foods and stuff that President Nygren, for example, has talked about? What do, to what do we attribute that? Well, first, I want to make a correction. I am not a doctor. Okay. <laughs> I am a registered nurse by profession. That's good. I'm very proud to be one. Um, so in terms of um, type 2 diabetes starting at younger ages, this is something that's uh, been a concern for the medical community and the American Diabetes Association for quite a while. And I definitely agree with Dr. Nygren that the availability of healthy foods and uh, having uh, it, closer to your availability, fast foods, uh, not just for, for Dr. Nygren, it's uh, the gas stations. And uh, for me, who works in the Bronx, it's uh, access to McDonald's and, I'm sorry for you, and other fast food companies uh, where it's, it's just higher fat in the foods and younger people are not, like I said, once you're introduced at a younger age, to uh, healthier foods, then, then the more likely are you are to have those foods when you're older. So Mrs. Brown is sort of counterintuitive for us to be cutting, you know, fruits and vegetables from the WIC formulary, as an example, um, and upping things like cheese uh, as part of the formulary for WIC. It just doesn't make any sense if we are trying to curb the cost of diabetes to be cutting fruits and vegetables out of WIC. Um, that's my statement. I won't make you say it. Um, I am intrigued by um, the disproportionate uh, um, uh, presence of diabetes in black Native Americans and Latino communities. And so I guess, Dr. Herman, there's no sort of uh, genetic proof that these folks are disproportionately susceptible to um, to enduring diabetes. So what would you say would our, or why do, how do you explain the disproportionate uh, onset of diabetes in these populations? I think uh, that's really an excellent question. Um, and, and I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I will say there are, there are, there are many investigators out there looking at that question specifically. What we do know is that, is that Obesity and diabetes in all populations is an interaction between genetic background and environmental exposure, and that includes diet and exercise and all sorts of things. Um, and, and, and so if there is an increase of, in prevalence of obesity and diabetes in one population, it is some combination of a change in their environment or inter interacting with, a change, which, with their genetics, which has not changed over decades, that's producing that outcome. And um, it takes intensive research to identify within specific populations what those specific factors are. But there are, there are many um, um, scientists and physicians out there searching for those answers within specific populations at this point. Well, thank you so much. Um, your testimony, I think Mrs. Uh, Brown Friday made the testimony that 85% of people who have diabetes um, are obese, are overweight. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so happy that I have reintroduced um, a bill uh, called the Treatment and Reduce uh, Obesity Act. Uh, I think that it'll give us some great results with regard to stemming one of the causes or one of the uh, uh, present uh, uh, features of diabetes. I wanted to ask uh, President Nygren, um, the Menominee and Oneida nations uh, in my state of Wisconsin um, have taken on a culturally relevant um, uh, project to use um, uh, sort of native foods to stem the, the tide of, uh, of, of diabetes. Can you describe what um, you all are doing in the Navajo Nation to, to um, include uh, culturally relevant foods? Uh, <clears throat> Congresswoman, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that our, our, our other tribal communities are, are doing that. And on, on behalf of the Navajo Nation, one of the things we're doing is walking and running. That's been very a part of our culture. And at the same time, introducing them to foods such as fruits and vegetables at all of our events. 
along with uh, like almonds and nuts and things like that that really help a, a, and promote a healthy lifestyle. Because one of the things we've always done is we take the IHS best practices and we try to focus on one of them for the year so that we can implement and educate our people on that. So we really have taken an approach where we invite the people out to the events and then they do a walk, a run, or we educate them on foods. But as far as farming, we're really trying to reintroduce farming because Navajo people have been farmers for a very long time. It's just that the, it's a lot easier to, to drive a couple hundred miles and get a bag of groceries than to, to actually do the work uh, and to produce healthy food. So, but that's something that we're really working on, Congresswoman. Thank you. And I, my time is waning, so I just want to get another question in uh, with Dr. Brown Friday. I didn't understand why the uh, continuous glucose monitor is not available to more low-income people. Is that something that is not authorized by Medicare, or what are the dynamics in, in terms of getting uh, these continuous glucose monitors available to low-income people? Unfortunately, I am not an expert in Medicare, uh, and I can, and so what I would have to say is that, in general, what I've heard from uh, patients is that their insurance will not cover the cost of utilizing the continuous glucose monitor if their blood sugars are not at a certain range or if they are not taking a certain number of injectable medications. And so, therefore, those are the things that are regulating the availability. Bureaucracy is stopping us from saving money. <laughs> okay. I'll yield back uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And, and we're going to talk about that because there's been a crash in the price of those units and some new products that just came in the market within the last six weeks. Um, Mr. Ferguson, or Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I want to thank you, thank you all for hosting this. And to the witnesses, thank you for your time, your presence here matters and we've learned a lot so thank you for taking time out of your schedules to to help educate us um, i want to start by my comments by saying that i truly believe that diabetes is probably the cruelest and most underrated disease in america there are a lot of other things that get a lot of attention and i'm glad to see that this body is is stepping up and, and focusing on this because it is such a long debilitating process many times um, it's, we, we tend to ignore because we don't see the, the rapid decline of, some, of, of someone. So this is important, so thank you for, for being here. Um, I was a practicing dentist for 25 years. I saw the oral effects of this um, week in and week out in my practice, but I also saw the systemic effects, and my ability to treat patients was, if, if they had diabetes was greatly restricted how they responded to care, how they responded to infections, how their body responded to antibiotics, all played a role in, in their overall health. I want, I want to focus on something that, that this committee has, that some of the questions have already started to go to because President Nigren, your comments about what you're doing in terms of, of, of food is really important. But I want to start with Dr. Herman. If you go back and look at the last, I don't know, 40, 50, 60, 80 years. When did we really see the explosion, of the exponential growth in, in diabetes with, within various populations? What's sort of the, the timeline and how has that accelerated? I think uh, the dramatic increase in, in, in uh, prevalence began uh, largely in the 70s and of both obesity and that paralleled by diabetes. Those, those both uh, dramatically increased at that point and I think the, the, the increase has been pretty consistent um, since the 70s. Okay. And when, when, we look at, when we look at things that have changed from a, from a policy standpoint, and this may be a question um, for, for anybody on, on this panel as well that may have a better history on this than I do, what, what in the early 70s changed our food supply? What did we begin to prioritize? And what was the, and, and what was the biggest part of that? Was, was it, it was calories, right? So when we started to value calories over quality nutrition, then we set this thing in motion. 
when I first started my dental practice in 1992, I could tell the difference in kids that grew up in the country on well water and kids that grew up in the city limits that, that grew up on fluoridated water because the quali- the, the, their oral health was dramatically affected because the kids that grew up on, on well water had, you know, just that they were ravished by cavities. Income didn't matter, okay? Kids that grew up in the city on fluoridated water, again, because w- without regard to income, they had much better oral health outcomes. As I went through 20 years of practice, I could no longer distinguish between the two of them. And the common link that I saw in this was the food supply and the increase in sugar in our food supply in every form refined carbohydrates. I think we've got to take a, I think we've got to be very focused on our food supply. Um, we, we can talk about spending more money on SNAP. Uh, you know, listen, I, again, I think cutting fruits and vegetables out of, you know, out of nutrition programs is, is absolutely, is absolute lunacy. But I also think that funding, you know, allowing folks to buy high, high sugar content foods is, is like saying we're, we're going to pay somebody to keep smoking while they've got lung cancer. I, I don't mean to equate the two, but again, let, let's, let's be smart about what we're doing here. I, I, President Nigren, when when y'all when y'all have done the the work and you've talked about the success that you've had, what what other other than money, what what's the most important thing you think of? Or do you think we should be doing as a government in terms of the nutritional aspect of what your program is your programs are focusing on? Thank you, Congressman. I think one of the most important things, as you mentioned, is. Uh, being able to tailor the, the the nutrition and the programs to Navajo people and in the different tribes across the country, which is important because every tribal nation is different. There is different foods and exercises and ceremonies that they use throughout their history. But if we can continue to tailor that, because I know over the past 20 year or or the past decade, when we've actually been able to tailor it more geared towards more Navajo, more Navajo foods, more Navajo ex- types of exercises. The actual the statistics have gone down because it was we were able to tailor it to to work with uh, the existing dollars that we've had we, that we've been getting, and it's been very helpful. So I think that when we continue to uh, think about the groups specifically to their needs, then it's a lot easier. Because I know up on Navajo, as I mentioned earlier, it's very r- remote and rural, but there's just so much access to processed foods that there's not enough options that people can have more access to, I think. So I think education is very critical in that part, too. So thank you. Thank you. And look, I, I don't, there, there is, I, I think we don't, we shouldn't try to make this a, a, a one, a, a, make a false choice here of either addressing the food supply or continuing to innovate because that, it, it, it's going to take both of these things, in my humble, humble opinion. Um, uh, Ms. Brown, Friday, just a, a comment, and again, I practiced in a rural area. Um, my hometown was about 64% African American. Um, it was, and again, I saw this on a very regular basis. You, you talk about access to health care and, and access to health insurance. I want us to move because I, I, I truly believe that Americans have access to some type of health care, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's private insurance, whether it's, it's, it's care on the exchange. I, I want us to really focus on utilization. And, and, and because I can tell you in my, in, in my practice, my patients had access to care. It was the utilization of the system. And all too often, and, and be candid with you, what we saw is that too many of our fellow Americans live in poverty, and they live in the crisis of the moment. And the preventive aspect of health care and the early access many times takes a back seat to a plethora of other emergencies that are going on in somebody's week in, in a given time. And, and Ms. Brown, I'm not. I don't mean to lecture you on this. Please don't. I, please don't. Don't take that. But but help us talk more about the utilization of, of, the, of the system um, in addition to making sure that the people have access to care. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I yield back. Thank, Thank you again for, for hosting this. And Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you all for being here. 
today to discuss this uh, critical issue that face, faces uh, you know, too many Americans um, that carry not only physical but also uh, you know, medical effects for families, but also you know, the high cost for folks that uh, live with diabetes. And President Nigren, great to see you here. Good to see you again. And thanks for being such an important voice on this issue. Um, I you know, spent a good amount of time on the Navajo Nation. And I know well the impact that diabetes has on our tribal communities. Uh, we've got 22 tribes in the state. And this disease has dire consequences. And um, there are a lot of individuals that are suffering from this. And many are members of your tribe and the other tribes. Um, and I know you've worked very hard to impress upon the federal government the importance of the special diabetes program for Indians. Could you talk a little bit more in depth about that, the impact it has had on the Navajo Nation, and tell us why it's so important that Congress reauthorize this program before it expires at the end of September, and what are the consequences if we do not reauthorize it? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Kelly. I appreciate you. Uh, I'm always happy when you're uh, spend some time out in our communities and all the communities across the state of Arizona. But one of the effects that I've had is just kind of just to kind of read some statistics here is uh, for the first time, diabetes prevalence in American Indian and Alaskan Native adults has decreased and has done so consistently for four years, dropping 15.4 percent from 2013 to uh, from 2013 to 2017. So I think that uh, just a decrease in diabetes prevalent, prevalence was great with through the SDPI program. Also, diabetes-related mortality has decreased from uh, uh, about 37 percent during those times. Again, um, these are just some of the stats. The, the key thing there is it's decreasing. Whatever the percentage is that, is that this program is working, and we're really trying to – it's very unique. There's only, over 300 um, communities that it's serving across the country. I know there's, I think, about a dozen that's tailored to the Navajo Nation. But overall, I think it's critical because we're trying to make sure that we can continue to have healthy people in our communities so that they can thrive and for it to be renewed, which is coming up very soon. And I think that the, 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 the both both house, both uh, both the Senate and the House has approved it for about 170 million through their committees. And really, that's 20 million more than the 150 that we were initially getting. And that 150 has been consistent for 20 years, so this 20 million is is a good amount of uh, increase to really help us get some of some of those programs out there ro uh, implemented right away because it's 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 critical in terms of not every Indian country is the same, but the tailored approach and the partnership that we've been able to to develop through this program has really helped us because. I always see pictures of our elders. Um, they were young, they were slim, they're fast, they, they looked very healthy a lot of the time. So when you look through histories, of, it's because as, as, as the president, I have access to historical photos and things like that that I look at that's within our communities. They were farmers, they were ranchers, they were, they were, they were gardeners, and you just look at how healthy some of these people look through history. And then you look at the people now, it's, it's very sad to see that we've come from very self-determined, uh, self-resilient people to people that are just uh, really trying to fight for their lives on a daily basis. So again, I think that this program is critical, and I definitely would continue to ur urge both the House and the Senate to approve this. So thank you, Senator. What would, what would happen if we didn't reauthorize it? We, we, for the Navajo, all of Indian country would lose about, they'd lose staff, they lose the programs. They lose the people. But tell me the, what the consequences of that would be. I mean, I think we know what the consequences are. Yeah, I think you'd lose a lot more people to diabetes. Yeah, people would die. Mm -hmm. And probably in significant numbers. Significant numbers, and you would also, a lot of people would lose hope and faith. And it would just be very, uh, I think it would just break a lot of hearts because not only are you looking at communities that are already in dire poverty levels, but you would put them in even tougher situations. And folks, even, you know, some can't even, you know, for seniors, you know, insulin's now capped at $35 a month. And, you know, for some other individuals, the uh, pharmaceutical companies have provided in insulin at $35 a month, but that could still be unaffordable 
very hard to afford mm -hmm. for uh, members of the Navajo Nation, which is one of the poorest uh, areas of the country. Um, and that is true for uh, the other tribal communities in the state of Arizona and across the nation. So um, it's critical that we reauthorize this program in September. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this has been a, a fascinating discussion, and I think um, uh, uh, very important that we hold uh, this hearing. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, as the chairman has, uh, has uh, said previously, this is a driver of our health care costs that will impact our future expenditures, our future debt. Uh, but it's also, and as he's fully aware, uh, it affects so many uh, other areas. It affects uh, ab the ability for individuals to lift themselves out of poverty by, by taking a great job. It affects that workforce participation participation rate that is so uh, critical for us to, to grow an economy. And it affects the everyday uh, ability of individuals to, to live their lives uh, to the fullest. And I think, you know, if there's, there's a lot of things we could do for our constituents, but, uh, you know, if somehow diabetes could be solved, uh, it would have a dramatic impact, perhaps more impact on our constituents than anything else that we could possibly do. And by the way, the same thing could be said for heart disease, uh, for cancer, and for Alzheimer's. All of these are, are drivers of all of these uh, conditions, including, including our expenditures and including the impact on people's lives. Uh, and it's been a great discussion. I agree with so much of what has been said here. Uh, I agree with uh, Senator Lee that we should, um, we should create a system that promotes additional um, private investment, uh, private innovation to help come to to to, to uh, help to develop new solutions uh, for treatment. But I also agree uh, with others who have talked about the government role in this. Uh, you know, I've always supported investment in NIH funding, uh, which uh, is very very important to drive. Uh, to, to, to drive the, the underlying uh, research and development that leads to some of those uh, innovations. Uh, and then, like it or not, I think the government has for a long time been engaged through the choices that, or the incentives maybe is, is a better way to put it, the incentives that we've had in the system regarding nutrition, uh, regarding the food that people eat. You know, we've done food pyramids, we've done recommendations, we've done school lunches, recommendations there. Uh, and then we've done the SNAP program, the Farm Bill. All of these help to lead to decisions that folks are making about their own uh, lifestyle, about their own nutrition, exercise, and so on. And so we're in this, like it or not. And so we ought to be looking uh, not only at the opportunities for additional new treatments that we could help uh, to ensure that the, the right conditions are there for those to develop, but we ought to be incentivizing the right human behaviors to, uh, to, to prevent uh, the disease to the extent that we can, that individuals can prevent it in the first place. So I guess the first question I have, Dr. Herman, I, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to get your thoughts. Uh, we've talked about the link between obesity and diabetes. We've talked about uh, the link uh, from the early 70s of, of uh, you know, the commoditization of food, uh, the sort of what we have promoted. How much of diabetes is related to these lifestyle choices that individuals make? If you had, air, you know, just for imagine for a minute that you know, people are, eating healthily, they're exercising, they're doing the things that we know um, are, are good lifestyle choices. How much of diabetes would we do away with if that were the case? So it's, it, thank you for the question. It's really an excellent question. Um, it, it is quite clear that, uh, you know, a, a significant, significant proportion of type 2 diabetes is the direct result of obesity. Um, and, and it's also clear that, that uh, uh, some lifestyle choices play into the development of obesity and, and diabetes in, in that path. Um, it's hard to quantify how much is, 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 is you know, how, how much of the lifestyle or which components of lifestyle or other environmental factors are the specific factors that have led to this epidemic. Um, and, and so uh, there's a tremendous amount of controversy uh, around what are the specific uh, nutritional components or combination of 
uh, nutrients or how uh, or, or uh, in what in what fashion are they presented that leads to obesity per se and diabetes and yet it's clear that that is a major component sure it's hard, it's hard so, to nail down an amount sure yeah. uh, anybody else want to take a stab at that I know President Nygren you've talked about the importance of programs uh, that encourage uh, good nutritional choices and exercise and so on is anybody else uh, you know, want to take a stab at you know, how much we could resolve if people were making the right uh, choices and had access to the, to the right nutrition. Uh, again, as president, one of the things I've, of, of the Navajo Nation I've noticed is that, I think you, Congressman, is that when people get out there, I think they're really enjoying these walks and the runs and opportunity to educate themselves on healthy foods, healthy diets, healthy lifestyles. Um, I've seen a lot of people change come turn around and they tell me, President, this is what I looked like a couple of years ago and now I've been attending these events that are being hosted and sponsored by this program that we're trying to get reauthorized and really to me it's, um, it, it helps, it helps dramatically. I don't know the percentage or the numbers but I think that it's, it's better, it would definitely decrease and it's just, it just, I think overall mental health, depression, diabetes, I think it really just, helps the person overall if they can eat healthier and participate and exercise. So I think that in my community, it's really been working. So Yeah, and I don't know, just go ahead. I think that you said a very key thing. I think uh, the availability of healthy food is really a very big key access. Um, you said that let's imagine that everybody is eating healthfully, but that's not the case. Right. That everyone doesn't have the healthful foods available to them, and or they cannot afford the healthful foods that are out there. Um, and I think that um, that's one of the, that's the key that we have to think about. I think that definitely, as President Nygren was saying, when uh, people are introduced to things and they're introduced to healthier lifestyles and healthier ways, they really do want to take advantage of it. I'm not saying it's 100%, obviously, but I think that for the most part, and those who I've worked with who I've introduced healthier lifestyles through lifestyle change programs um, have embraced it and have made significant changes. But again, it's access. If I could just follow up on that, I couldn't agree more with that, by the way. Um, and, and we don't maybe know the exact amount, but you know, the, the dramatic impact, we, I think, all would agree with that. And so I, I, I think this is a wonderful discussion to have in regards to how we can uh, ensure that you know, new treatments are being developed. But I think we need to spend a lot of time figuring out how government programs today are incentivizing uh, uh, you know, bad nutritional choices, and I'm talking about the, the, uh, the uh, SNAP program, I'm talking about the Farm Bill. Uh, you know, we subsidize a lot of agricultural uh, development as well, a lot of farming. And we ought to be thinking about how we can ensure that we're, uh, we're educating, we're encouraging people to make the right choices, and then access is so critical. Um, and I completely agree. These are discussions that we really should be having to, to you know, help to ensure that people have access to being able to make the right choices and know what those choices should be. So th thank you so much for, for holding this hearing. It's been a great discussion. Thank you, Mr. Schmucker. To my good friend, Peter. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very good to be with my colleagues from the House. Um, you know, the, t the, the two issues that we've been talking about, everyone seems to be focusing on our nutrition and exercise, right? Because it's after the fact, if you get diabetes, then you get into the incredible medical challenges that folks face. So uh, it, it, I am interested in what are the policies, but it's tough to get good food. Uh, Ms. Dr. Ferguson left and he was talking about how uh, being poor is a hard job. It's a full-time occupation just to try to figure out how to get from here to there. You know, you might have to take three buses as opposed to just get in your car and go. Uh, you have to really try to figure out where you can get something that's affordable uh, for you, which isn't necessarily the most nutritious. So I'm just interested uh, in maybe hearing from each of you what are, like, the two things that could be done to try to help folks who are really low income and struggling with a lot of the everyday challenges of uh, trying to make things work. What could be two policies that would help both with nutrition and make an exercise available? Dr. Herman, start with you. So, so uh, 
uh, in terms of in terms of exercise, I mean, the things we do with every patient we see is is start with simple things, which is suggest try to get ten thousand steps a day. These are right. these are things that that, that that cut across socioeconomic status uh, that are shown to be beneficial, and um, it starts right. so with ten thousand steps. Yes. All right. Yeah. How are you doing today? On that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably about a quarter of the way there today. <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Ippolito? Um, you know, the rest of the folks on the panel are, are better experts on the specific policies. I'll just raise one thing that is important for all of these policies, which is if they function through insurance, we always have to be very careful that we don't allow insurance companies to use policies that really are sort of nominally designed to be, you know, helping people be healthier, but instead really just risk select. They try and attract healthy people onto your insurance. Right. So whatever the specific policies, I'll just flag that as one consideration to keep in mind. Thank you. Ms. Brown, Friday, you, you deal on the ground with lots of folks. I do deal with a lot of folks, and I think um, access, as I have been mentioning multiple times, to uh, more nutrition, more nutritious um, uh, foods, more vegetables in both rural and uh, and urban areas, as well as safe areas for people to exercise, because that's also building infrastructure, um, having. Um, uh, either a park or even assisting people who might want to go to a gym uh, to pay for that uh, so that they can exercise in a safe environment. You know, the thing that I find about exercise is the more easy it is to do that's integrated into whatever your day is. Your day is different than my day. So how do you find a way within your day and anybody's day for them to get the exercise? And if they have to go to a gym, that's a project. Well, again, it doesn't have to be going to a gym, having a safe place in your neighborhood to yeah. walk. And I do have these conversations with some of my, my patients. Uh, do you have a safe place to walk? Uh, you know, do you, or can you just walk up, up and down your stairs? If yeah. you're talking about me personally, I get up at 5.30 in the morning. But <laughs> uh, I can't talk to everyone else. Thank you. Well, the gentleman President. yell. Will the gentleman yes. yell? Sure. What about these... Um, Medications and behavior modification, the medications to, like Ozempic, I think is the name of one of them. What about that as an intervention? Dr. Herman, anybody? Sh sure. Uh, so, so it is clear that medications like Ozempic and in, in that class of medication, um, they are very effective in helping people suppress their appetite and reduce their caloric intake and lose weight. Um, and, and they have not been approached as kind of a, 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 a you know, what, what would their impact be if used widely as a preventative measure? But I think it's probably a matter of time before, uh, just a matter of time before folks like yourselves begin to think about utilizing interventions like that in that way from a public policy perspective. I yield back to the gentleman. Uh, President Nigren. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, w one of the things I think about is trying to start early for our young kids, because on Navajo yeah. and a lot of reservations, there's not a lot of parks, not a lot of playgrounds, and not a lot of places to play basketball or any sports activity. So I think that one way for us to do it is, is probably to create those parks and facilities so that kids while they're younger they can learn how to exercise and then as adults to have these facilities open to them because they're on, on on a lot of reservations a lot of these things are funded by the government but they're closed off from eight to f after they're only open from eight to five right. and then they're closed and then after school and people that have left high school don't have access to go and exercise thank you very much are you back Thank you, Senator Welsh. Yeah, I don't think I sure got around to saying congratulations. You, um, um, we're going to actually try to we're going to try to do the canyon. Um, I know, I know a house coded insult when I hear it. <laughs> oh yeah, I was heading that direction. Yeah. All right, um, I saved myself for last because, as for some of my colleagues here, this is a fixation for me. Um, and for me, it started on the economics. Um, I've had a number of you say 25%. I can actually show you really well peer-reviewed numbers that it's 33% of all healthcare spending, 31% of Medicare spending is functionally related to diabetes. Um, I hope everyone will get a chance to read the Republican Joint Economic Report, Chapter 3. We 
went to a place that's very uncomfortable for some, but we actually looked at diabetes and obesity in society, and it's, it's both its cost, its moral cost, its, its potential effects on income inequality, care a lot about this. So let me, instead of proving what an idiot I am by just talking, um, we over and over and over and over and over had this discussion. Changes in the farm bill. Access to the technology, the new over-the-skin blood glucose. Um, a new one actually got released a couple days ago. It's just a wristband that works. Um, number three, the adoption of some of the GLP-1s for those who are particularly in the, the morbid categories or those who have type 2 diabetes, um, particularly now that we may have the oral, the single shot, which is fascinating, which may be making it through FDA. And number four, maybe by the end of the decade for our brothers and sisters who have succeeded in getting their weight down, but um, I'm seeing some data sets that say about 30% of that population which had type 2 diabetes, their body will not start to produce islet cells that produce insulin again. There's actually new, some of the new um, stem cells, not just the cadaver bleaching model, but actually some of the um, ones that are in type 1 that look like they've already um, have high efficacy there may be this path over the 10 years of a radical change in diabetes in our society. And our math is that's five or six trillion dollars of spend in the 10 years. It's real money. And it may be the one path we have where our brothers and sisters on the left and those of us on the right actually might agree on something. Dr. Herman, start here and let's go down. Tell me where I'm right. Tell me where I'm wrong. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm willing to take the beatings. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> so, so I mean, uh, I, I'll just go say this from you know the perspective of, of a physician who's been treating these conditions for for a couple of decades. The last decade has been a revelation with the new technology and these new medications. We have things to offer patients for the first time that are incredibly effective for conditions that were previously very difficult to treat, and the options seem to be improving. And, um, and so I'm, I'm very optimistic about the possibilities over the next 10 years um, uh, in applying these, in these, the, these uh, medications and technologies more widely. I'll highlight, I'll highlight um uh, perhaps a piece of optimism on the cost side too. We often see sort of transformational developments in the pharmaceutical market or, or devices that are sort of one shot, but we don't have that here. We have classes with lots of different products coming to market that have different benefits and, and costs, of course, but that's beneficial in the short term because it means you have competition to get on formularies, you have price competition in the short term that you don't always get, and beyond that, you as a patient now have four, it's like with statins, you have four options to choose from. You can choose what's best for you. But I'll also highlight, you know, 10-year budget windows, I understand the focus for you guys, but when you think about the costs of drugs and technologies, I think you got to think longer term. You got huge savings when things come off patent, which happens, you know, in the case of and, GLP. And, and there's some GLP ones that are almost at the end of their um, patent right. cycle. Right, and so as that starts happening, it's not just that those prices go down, it's that it puts more pressure on the remaining on-brand products to compete with those off-brand products. And so I'll sort of signal a hopeful point on the cost side that I think it may not be quite as devastating as some other uh, projections are. Ms. Brownfeld. Uh, well, from my perspective, I would say that I am very thankful and hopeful that all the innovations do come to pass and that it's available to everybody. Um, and I want to say also that in terms of cost, um, insulin wasn't always extremely um, expensive. And it became expensive um, due to whatever it, it, the situation well, it, came to. Yes. No, 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 no. You're absolutely. And look, we've had a fixation on the co-op that's about 70 miles from here. Matter of fact, it's not too far from where you are. Um, that actually is also producing even lower than the subsidized price. But the revolution is here. I do have an intense concern, though, that it be available for all populations. I agree with you, if, if, if indeed it is. And Navajo Nation, look, you know, I've, I've, I've been blessed as a young man. I spent lots of time in the community. And most folks who've never been there don't understand. Um, there's rural, and then there's the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you actually have a really tricky job because, you know, let's be honest, window, living in Window Rock's a lot different than some of the chapter houses, you know, up near the border. Um, but I'm incredibly hopeful with, with your leadership. What can we do if, if, if my fantasy is change the farm bill, access to the blood glucose type of management so you can actually see your macros start to understand your diet, that maybe living on fry bread, even though it's delicious, is difficult. Forgive me for the cultural reference. Um, what else can I do other than just funding another program? Is that revolution something we can actually deliver to the Navajo people? I think one of the things, I'm glad that you you brought that up, because even like with broadband, I'm, I'm trying to bring it up at that, that level. Like Starlink. Even, Starlink. Sat satellites. No more waiting another 25 years for a wire to go out to that chapter house. Put up the damn satellite. Sorry. Yeah. So if we go down that route, the, some form of some of the latest technology that's coming out, it'd be great to implement it within the IHS program so that it's being staged instead of later down the road. So I think that just having that better coordination with IHS so we can get it out to those main facilities out there, that, I think that would be a key thing is just communicating with the federal partners and the nation and then being able to have our people have access to the latest and greatest. Thank you. In, in some ways, this is a derivative of even where Mr. Beyer had asked a question. Um, I'm blessed to represent um, Salt River, you know, Pima Maricopa. Um, I've lived my whole life next to that community and Fort McDowell. And, you know, it's a it's an economically stable community, you know, being that close. It's an urban tribe. And yet I th I've seen some data that says it may be the second highest per capita diabetic population in the world. And their sister tribe, Gila, may be number one. So and sometimes it's more complex than just saying it's poverty. It turns out time is... is, is um, uh, some have said sometimes it's our need for convenience and those things. And that's why, for those of you who actually also have the microphone and the credibility uh, for what you all do, help those of us who, who care passionately tell the story. Maybe it is time for revolution in what we do in the farm bill. Maybe just growing the same five commodity crops when North America used to grow 3,300 types of grain. Um, optionality, so you don't have to process a process to make a profit. Number two, the, ability, the new technology. I'm, I'm dying for the Apple Watch that actually will have blood glucose in it, though I'm told it might be two generations away, so I'm going to just buy the Samsung. Um, <laughs> I'm glad someone got that joke. Um, but the GLP-1s, every day I'm reading an article about someone that's coming out with new products. So your point that the prices are crashing the availability here, and there may be some that are almost out of patent expiration. Maybe the crazy thing is we buy the damn patent. We buy its last 18 months and use that for our Medicare, Medicaid, Indian Health Services, um, VA populations, um, because the savings is remarkable. I mean, um, sometimes those of us who are on the right sound cruel because we're talking about the dollars and cents and don't talk enough about the morality of people's lives and their ability to participate in society and the income inequality that health differential causes. Um, but the four of you actually are on the cusp of the thing that may be the one point we can, if we could build a unified theory here, that could have amazing impact on U.S. sovereign debt and economic growth. Um, but it can't be what a lot of us here do, which is we talk about the one thing we know of eating onion rings are, you know, fry bread. Um, uh, have you ever had an avocado taco? I'll explain it later. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's so, in the last part here, I need to give myself, and this is the danger of being unscripted, I owe thank you to the Democrat staff and the Republican staff, thank you for actually communicating with each other on this. Um, this is one where the solution is great economics and wonderful morality. Help us tell the story. Um, 
The last bit I will give you is if any of you have things you want us to read, um, we're not walking away from this. This is almost the only path I have to dramatically change um, the direction of the society right now. Send it to us, and we'll continue to evangelize it. And then for all of you, um, uh, you have, I think it is another, how many days to be able to submit additional for the record? Three. How many? Three. Three days? In the House, we do a lot more. If you have other documents that you'd like us to put into the public record, please send it our way. Please do it within three days, but if you send it on the fourth day, I'll still put it in. And with that, we call this hearing adjourned. Thank you for participating.